Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for attending the roundtable Second Language Speech Data, Methodological Possibilities and Challenges. I am Dr. Rosane Silveira. I'm a faculty member at the Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina, and I will mediate the session. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be asking questions and taking questions from the audience to share with the speakers. You can use the chat to type your questions and indicate who um, you would like to answer the questions. I would like to thank our technical support and our interpreters who are here today with us, Sansão, um, Anderson, and later Humberto. Uh, our guests in order of presentation are Dr. Hanna Kivisto de Souza. She's a faculty member at the Federal University of Santa Catarina and currently she is a visiting researcher at the University of Turku in Finland. We also have Dr. Filipe Kupski, who is a faculty member at the Federal University of Bahia, and Dr. Ronaldo Lima Jr., who is a faculty member at the Federal University of Ceará. We are going to cover some topics relating to, related to open sciences, which is the major theme of the, the event. So in tune with, with this theme of open science, um, this round table will discuss um, three topics. Uh, the first one by Dr. Hanna Kivisto de Souza is going to be on ethics in international research projects involving L2 speech data. Our second topic uh, will be presented by Dr. Felipe Kupski and he will be talking about bilingual attrited speech data collection. And finally, Dr. Ronaldo Lima Jr. will be talking about L2 speech corpus creation. So I thank you all for being here. Remember uh, sending your questions. And then I would like to invite Dr. Hanna Kivisto de Souza to begin her presentation. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the presentations, Hosani. Um, so let's start then. Um, you have here my contact information in case there are any questions that were not answered during the talk. You can send me an email, please, and I will try to answer your questions. The aim of my presentation today is to discuss the possibilities and challenges of international collaboration in second language speech research, focusing on EU data protection regulation. The reason that I chose this topic that is possibly dry is due to my experience as a visiting researcher at the University of Turku in Finland. So even though I had prepared months in advance, um, there were still many things that I got surprised about when I actually started my data collection. So I hope that this talk can be of use for fellow researchers uh, who are planning to do data collection in Europe. Okay, so we will start with uh, short kind of smooth introduction to the topic by talking about research um, in second language speech in Brazil and research ethics more specifically. And then we will move on discussing conducting L2 speech research in Finland. And we will discuss the specific law that I mentioned. And of course, we're interested to see how this impacts L2 speech researchers. Hopefully, I will also present to you with some solutions and possibilities that you don't get discouraged, but actually are interested in carrying out research in Europe. Right. So, um, the my my talk today is about research that we carry on ourselves, where we collect data ourselves um, with human subjects. So, I'm not talking about uh, creating a corpus or using a corpus. Um, research. Um, some challenges that we face uh, as researchers on all human subjects is with participants. So first we have to find the participants. Sometimes it can be easy. Many times 
it is difficult, especially if we want a specific profile of participants, uh, for example, native English speakers in Brazil. Um, also, maintaining the participants can be a problem, so we rely on participants' goodwill. And apart from these um, challenges that are common for all research carried out with humans, um, we also have specific requirements for the data collection environment. So we need a quiet room, uh, specific research equipment, and so on, right? Um, of course, we're also dealing with human voice, uh, which can be um, awkward or very sensitive for the research participants. So we have to take that into account and, of course, assure that the data collection follows ethical guidelines. Right. So before we talk about research in Europe, let's take a look about carrying out research ethics in Brazil. Okay. So all research... Uh, that involves research with human beings is subjected to ethics committees in Brazil. And what is important to understand is that even if the research is carried out outside Brazil, so for example, European Union, the researcher has to follow uh, ethic guidelines of Comitês de Ética, right? So in the case that the researcher works or studies in a Brazilian university. So the same rules apply in Brazil and if you go abroad. Uh, this impacts several things. For example, uh, consent form. So in Brazil, it is obligatory for you to ask participants to sign a consent form. In other countries, it might not be necessary. Um, the participation also following the ethics committees in Brazil has to be entirely voluntary. So we cannot pay participants, which can be a problem for participants in other countries where they are, for example, used to receiving um, um, payment for their time. Um, apart from these rules that are common, whether you carry out research in Brazil or abroad, there are some additional ethical requirements for international research. The uh, act that I mentioned here specifically, and this gives some additional information about um, what we have to take into account additionally. Among them, uh, working with another researcher, we have to detail what are um, our rights and obligations and what are the other researchers' rights and obligations. And we also have to present a proof that the other country um, or the other country's ethics committee has approved our study, or if not, we have to explain why. Okay, so now we're ready to move to the discussion about conducting L2 speech research in Europe. I will be talking about a specific law that was passed fairly recently in Europe and as it has great impacts for Brazilian researchers who are interested in carrying out uh, data collection in Europe. Before we talk about this specific law, though, I would like to discuss some research ethics that are quite relevant. Okay. Before... Um, we start the discussion, I should mention that there is certain autono uh, autonomy between different European countries. So countries can decide a little bit of how they will follow the law and they can have their own ethics committees and ways of assessing research. However, here in this talk, I'm, I'm focusing on the ethics committees in Finland, right? Um, in Finland, there is something called the Finnish National Board on Research Integrity. This is part of the Ministry of Education, and its function is to um, assess and make sure that the ethical code of conduct is followed, right, in all scientific disciplines. Uh, apart from that, universities can have their own ethics committees, and these ethics committees, just like in Brazil, would carry out the um, ethical review. Ethical review is required in Finland, and this is where different countries can have different requirements. In Finland, ethical review is required only if the research is of sensitive nature. 
meaning, for example, that the participation in the research project is not voluntary. So think about, for example, Labov's classical study in department stores in New York. Um, in that case, you would need, he would need um, to submit for an ethical review. Um, if there are some kind of big risks overall, and if we're studying children in those cases or teenagers, in those cases, uh, we should apply for an ethical review in Finland. In other situations, which is usually the case of L2 speech research, ethical review is not necessary. And it is expected that the researchers follow the code of conduct on their own. When I talk about the code of conduct, there actually is a document that was published in 2017. It is translated to all European languages and it is a framework for self-regulation for all the different disciplines in science. Okay, um, let's take a quickly a look at some of the spe uh, specific issues that are specified in this code of conduct. You will notice that many of the aspects um, that are mentioned here are also required in Brazil. Let's focus, I've only picked the most important things here that are most relevant for us as the researcher. There are also some information for the institutions, um, and so on. So in relation to data, what are good research practices? Um, the researchers have to design and carry out their research in a careful and well-considered manner. Uh, they have to publish the results in open and honest way, respect the confidentiality of the data, which is something that we will discuss, and also to handle research subjects, which can be either human, animal, cultural, social, and so on, with respect and care. And researchers and organizations have to ensure access to data and guarantee security and preservation of all data. You can see from these practices that this is not something very new, right? This is quite universal for ethics, for academics all over the world. What I find interesting, though, is that this is um, this has been written down in an actual code of conduct, and I think that's that's what makes a difference. Fantastic. The good practices for research don't discuss only the role of the researcher as an individual, but also as a part of the research community and collaboration is encouraged. This comes clear from these practices that you can see on the screen right now. So if you have co-authors, it is expected that each researcher will take responsibility of the integrity of the research, that there is some kind of formal agreement at the beginning of the research project, and uh, in relation to publication, so you actually commit that you will publish the work and, uh, and present it. Um, the last part here also that researchers take serious with their commitment to the research community by participating in refereeing and reviewing is quite interesting. Um, so you could see that some of these, many of these ideas are universal and followed also by researchers in Brazil. But I think that there are some differences and I think it's interesting to bring them to your attention for you to compare. Um, research institutions and organizations, so universities, um, have to give researchers rigorous training in research design, methodology, and analysis. As far as I know, where I work in Brazil, this is not an obligation. Researchers from the most junior to senior levels have to take training in ethics and research integrity. So on the code of conduct that I have just specified and on the relevant legislation. Um, also, researchers and the institutions have to provide transparency on how to access or make use of the data and the research materials. So open science, which is something that I believe we will be discussing more here. Um, this um, this afternoon. So this is something similar, I think, what we have in Plataforma Brasil, for example, for you to look at different research projects or what each university has in Brazil, okay? Something similar, maybe not as um, easily accessible, but still something similar. 
Right. So um, the concern for individuals' access to data is something that we will discuss more in detail in um, when we discuss uh, this data protection law that I have mentioned, right? So um, remember what I would like you to remember from what I have said so far about research ethics is to remember that it is not usually necessary for the researcher in Finland to uh, submit their research project for an ethical review. So this it, it is expected that researchers follow the code of conduct on their own um, and that they don't need that kind of supervision. So for example, in Brazil, it is obligatory for you to submit um, your research project for Comité de Ética whenever you will start one, right? Before you start one. And of course, there are differences between different countries um, and different universities. We can have, maybe if we have time to discuss this. Right. Okay. So the law that I was mentioning before, uh, the European Union issued in 2016 a law about data protection. This um, this law has the um, aim of discussing how data, personal data, is processed and moved around um, the world. Let's put it that way. Okay. So. 2016 was five years ago. It is not that this law is really, really new, but its implementation has taken a while and it has been implemented to different extents in different parts of Europe. Um, the main idea behind this uh, regulation is that everyone has the right to the protection of personal data concerning him or her, right? Um, and this is something that does not apply only to research. So, of course, here we're interested in talking about research, but this is something that impacts many fields of life. So any kind of situation where personal data is dealt with, such as um, enrolling for a school or exam results, commercial surveys, um, and so on, right? In relation to research, the objective is to protect the rights of the research subjects and to find balance between protecting research uh, subjects' personal data, as well as uh, the need to use personal data for scientific research. So this is actually quite a difficult balance, as you can, you can see. So um, notice that this regulation that I'm mentioning impacts only personal data. I think that it's necessary for us to define what is that we mean with personal data before we go any further on the different rules. So personal data basically is any data that is related to an identifiable person. So this could be, for example, name, email, address, um, telephone number, in modern times, IP address, and so on. So think, for example, for a pile of consent forms and participant signatures in them, or an Excel file where you have beautiful columns with subjects, names, IDs, uh, age, other demographic and linguistic variables. So that would be personal data. Also, uh, a person's image, voice, and political opinions are also considered personal data. And basically, if the data can be used to identify a person directly or restored to an identifi identifiable format, we're dealing with personal data. And thus, we have to take into account this data protection regulation. Um, personal data, you might be thinking that, okay, I'm not using my participants' names, I'm using pseudonyms. That is still considered personal data because even though pseudonymized data um, has this kind of coding system and it cannot be connected to a specific person, there is a code key. And usually the researcher has the code key. So if the researcher wants, they can connect the information from um, between the codes and the actual, actual names. And it's also important to understand that <clears throat> personal data is not just the names, but other things that can be used to identify the person. So for example, the inf information about school or age or languages spoken or profession and so on. So 
there is other type of information that is uh, considered personal data apart from the name. What would not be personal considered personal data is anonymized data. So if you have data uh, that you have treated in a way that makes it impossible for anyone, including yourself, the researcher, to identify the participants behind, then you can say that you have anonymized data and you would not have to worry about these, um, these regulations. However, LCU speech data and the type of research that we normally conduct, the type of data is normally not, it's not possible to anonymize it because apart from for us to make it impossible for us to identify the data, we should also take into account advancements of technology. So we should be able to ensure that our data has been treated in such a way that no one, not now or not in future, with, um, let's say, normal advancement of technology will not be able to identify the people behind the data. So my recommendation and the recommendation that I have received here is not to say that your data is anonymized, even though it would be the kind of easy way out, but our data is not really normally anonymized, but pseudonymized. Okay, so let's look at three issues that deal from, uh, that rise from this uh, reg resolute, uh, regulation about data protection, okay? So we will talk about participants, data storage, and data mobility. <clears throat> in practical terms, what does this EU data protection regulation say in relation to the research participants? Basically, it says that the research participants have the right to access information about themselves. So they have the right to know what their personal data is being used for, why is it being used for, how long it will be used for, and what will happen with the data once it is not used anymore, who will deal with their personal data, and what can be the consequences or risks of giving personal data to these people, okay? Um, so quite a lot of information. In relation to data, this is not maybe as surprising, but there are still some, I think, things to take into account. So in relation to data, how do we store data? Of course, we should store it securely and we should take technical and security measures to ensure that the data is stored securely. If there would be some kind of data breach, we should report it immediately to our supervisors, to the university's responsible um, parties, and to the research subjects. What's interesting though still is that we have to determine a lifespan for the data. So we cannot just collect data and keep it on our folders, physical or electronic forever. We have to actually determine how long we will use this personal data from this set of subjects and what we will do with the data once we don't use it anymore. Will we destroy it or will we form some kind of archive or something else, right? Let's take a look at these two issues that I have mentioned, participants and data in a little bit more practical terms. So what does this mean for um, non-European or Brazilian researchers who want to conduct data in the EU? It means that the researcher or the researchers, if this is a joint uh, effort, is the data controller. And this person is legally responsible for the data and accountable for the implementation of data protection measures. So the researcher becomes the responsi responsible for implementing um, the specific set of rules. Also, the research participants must be provided with a privacy statement. So remember that the research participants have the right to know what their data is being used for, who, who is using it, where it will be taken, for how long and so on. So all this information has to be given to the participants in the form of a privacy statement. Privacy statements are quite long, um, five or six pages. There's a lot of information and kind of legal information about what the data will be used for. And after reading this privacy statement, the participants also have to give consent on the treatment of their personal data as they have just read. 
So it is not enough that they give consent in uh, to participate in the study, but they also have to give consent on the treatment of their personal data. Uh, what is also important to understand is that only the people who the researcher has specified in the privacy statement that can access the data, only those people can actually access the data. So for example, if you have specified in a research project that you, the researcher, and your co-author will access the data, and then, I don't know, three years later, your advisee would really need, need those speech samples, you cannot give them access to that set of data because you haven't specified that and the participants have not given consent to that. So um, lots of lots of different rules, right? Uh, finally, the last and perhaps the most relevant issue for us being uh, researchers outside Europe is the transfer of personal data outside the European Union. Um, <clears throat> the data can only be transformed, uh, transferred sorry, outside the European Union if its security is not compromised. Um, these countries where the data can be transferred should offer uh, guarantees that are equal to those security guarantees offered by the European Union. And currently, the countries where data can be personal data can be transformed uh, transferred from within the European Union are the ones that you see here on the screen. So notice, for example, that England, United States, and Brazil are missing from this list. Okay, um, they have a set of criteria to analyze uh, whether the country fulfills this adequate level of protection or not. Um, and in the case that uh, the European Union uh, officials decide or get to the agreement that the third country does not fulfill the requirements, so basically most of the countries in the world, the data cannot be transferred uh, transferred to these countries without the subject's consent. So um, the subject must be made aware that of the risk of tra transferring data to a different country and what the researcher will do to protect to protect their data. So then what does this mean in practice? It means two things that are very important for us. So on the one hand, data cannot be stored in servers outside the European Union. This sounds a little bit funny. So for example, um, me, Han, the researcher, I cannot use my personal Dropbox account to store my research data because Dropbox servers for private clients are uh, located in the United States. Um, what is more relevant or equally relevant uh, is that researcher from, for example, Brazil cannot access participants' personal data being outside European Union. So, for example, you could not access participants' names um, and participants' speech samples, for example, because remember that speech is speech or person's voice is considered a personal characteristic, right? Um, and thus personal data. So, of course, this has huge impacts on the L2 speech researcher. It means something that we all love, so more paperwork, because you will need the consent form. You will need the privacy notice, which is the long form specifying how the data will be used. Um, you will need a consent form for personal data, and you will need uh, all the other research documentation, right? Um, you also have to be aware that if a subject, if a participant wants to access their personal data, you will have to provide them access. And if they want to be removed from your data set, you will also have you also have to give them the right to be removed. Um, if there are more than one researcher in the same project, the different researchers can have different roles when specified like this from the beginning. And of course, the biggest impact, the most difficult impact for L2 speech researchers is that the researcher who is outside the European Union will not have access to subjects' personal data, especially production data, right? Um, and this is, I believe, because why, why voice is in the list of personal characteristics. Um, 
it has uh, something to do with testing or examining a body part or um, biological sample or genetic data. So it is something that comes from our body. And from that, it is, I believe, considered um, personal data. I would like to give you also some solutions because I can understand how daunting this can be. So some solutions to overcome these um, challenges and not to let them to become problems is plan in advance. So I would say months in advance because it takes time. Become familiar with the legislation within the European Union and on the local level at different countries. Contact the host university to find out what are the regional differences, if there are any. Get help for preparing the privacy statement uh, because of the legal issue so that everything goes right. And also so that um, there is someone else who can share the uh, responsibility with you. Something obvious, try to collect as little personal data as possible. So think whether you really need to ask the subjects for their name, for their email address and so on. Because if you don't have that information, then you don't have to worry about that. Um, something maybe a little bit sad, uh, I put it here, uh, but give preference maybe to perception data. Of course, you can collect production data and I will show you how I'm doing it. But since perception data is just, let's say computer responses, for example, yes or no, this is not in um, nature, personal data. So that will be easier to dealt with because then this kind of legislation is not applicable. And I would really recommend um, you to collaborate with a, a European Union based researcher who can be a joint controller of all the data, who can then be responsible for parts of the personal data or maybe all of it. So this requires really collaboration on both parts to make it work. I will give you an example of the research project that I'm carrying out. It involves uh, speech perception and production. The type of personal data that will be collected is participants' name, demographic characteristics, information about their health. So for example, if they have uh, hear hearing impairments or speaking impairments or anything that could affect their production or perception of speech. And of course, speech samples. So the tasks that I have is a perception task that uh, gathers information. Basically, it is not, um, let's say, personal in nature because it is a perception task. But before the participants start with the task, they will have to specify their name. So it includes personal data as well. The same happens with the proficiency test. So they also have to specify their name. Then I have production task where I'm recording the participants, so I'm gathering their voice, and linguistic background questionnaire where I get access to all their linguistic and demographic and health information. The paperwork uh, resulting from this for the participants is the consent form, research brochure, um, privacy statement, and consent form to personal data use. So the consent form, I just wanted to remind you here that this is also uh, has to follow the rules of the Brazilian Ethics Committee at my university in Brazil. Right. So what, what did I do with this data then? OK, because, of course, I want to have access to this data once I'm in Brazil. So what did I do? Um, the perception data, the uh, proficiency data, and the linguistic background questionnaires have been pseudonymized at the beginning of the data collection. And the key for these codes, so for example, participant ID one, who is this in the real life? I don't have that information. That information, that key, let's say, to crack the pseudonymization code is with another researcher who is within the European Union. And I don't have access to that information. The production data is also challenging because I do want to have access to the production data that I have collected. Um, in this case, the voice files are also pseudonymized. So uh, they have the same codes as the rest of my data. And I had to get a specific uh, consent from the participants. So in the um, privacy statement, I had to specify that I will 
take their voice files outside of European Union to Brazil, and I will be implementing these and these security measures to try to make their data safe. And the participants signed the form. So, but they have to be made aware of this. And it's quite a lot of explanations. And finally, the consent forms themselves, they are not with me. They are, uh, they will be stored at the university cloud service after the data collection has finished, right? So not in physical form, but scanned in a cloud service. So I will actually never have access to them. So what can we then conclude? I know my time is coming to an end. So research ethics are in a key role in researchers' decisions. They are quite universal, but there are some local practices that vary. Brazilian researchers who want to collect data in Europe must comply with the local ethics committees, um, let's say the Brazilian ethics committee's rules, as well as the uh, host country's ethics committees and the uh, European Union legislation. So planning really is the key. Uh, and I believe that collaborations can lead to fruitful partnerships and research projects. And when there is a will, there is also a way. So I definitely do not want to discourage you. On the contrary, I want to encourage you to carry out data in different, um, in different universities and collaborate with different researchers and just being planned on, on how to do it. Here you have some of the references and more information that I have um, where you can look for more information. You can also get in touch with me on the email that I mentioned at the beginning. And that is it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Hannah, for your presentation. Uh, we will be discussing all the, the presentations at the end, okay? Uh, for now, I would like to invite um, Dr. Filipe Kupski to join us and to present his work on bilingual attrited speech data collection. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, I do hope everyone is well and safe. Um, so I'm very happy. Um, it's a very happy day for me um, because it's a great honor to be in this round table with Rosane Silveira, Hannah Kevisto de Souza and Ronaldo Lima Jr. Um, researchers and colleagues I really admire. So thank you for the invitation. Um, I special thank you for our interpreters uh, for doing the insane job, right, of interpreting from English into Libras. So um, the title of my presentation is Investigating a Try to the Bilingual Speech, Dynamic Methodological Challenges. Uh, well, just a second. Okay, so um, acknowledgement to my foreign agencies. I also need to thank Halabiko, Nukfali, and Lafala, the places, labs, and research groups I work in. Um, and the main objective of this talk is to present some methodological challenges imposed by language attrition. Um, specifically on the investigation of bilingual speech production and perception. Um, so I divided this talk into four parts. So part one is revisiting L1 stability, language as an open system. So um, as you can see, it's a biased presentation, right? As I draw from dynamic system, from complexity theory. Then we have the part two, uh, challenges investigating L2 speech development. And finally, part three, challenges in investigating first language attrition. Of course, um, I'll talk about just some few of the challenges. And for those who are interested, um, you may also download this presentation in PDF and some you know, reading suggestions. Uh, just point your camera to this QR code. Uh, don't worry if you don't get the time to do that now. Um, I'll show the code at the end of this presentation as well. I'm going to give you about two seconds. Okay, so um, part one, revisiting L1 stability, language as an open system. Um, we know that in second language development, new categories will be established um, in a bilingual brain. Um, but we also know that all the languages of a multilingual, and I mean L1, L2, L3, they are anchored in a single neural network, a single neural architecture. We may speak 10 languages, for example, but in the end of the day, we have only one brain. Um, so in the beginning of second language development, the way we process, the way we represent, and the way we use the new language 
is going to be influenced by the dominant L1. So we have a dominant first language that will transfer to the second language, as in this image. Um, so, um, and that's why, for example, we initially pronounced uh, L2 sound with a Brazilian accent. And this will be my first take home message. I know ideally uh, every presentation has one take home message, but I will present you three take home messages. So the take home message one is um, and important for the rest of the present this presentation, accents are expected. They are an integral, normal part of second language development. Um, so this image um, represents what we expect from second language development. So we expect a dominant first language influencing the second language. This is the expectation, but this is also the reality. This is also what we get. And that is brilliant. That's fine. Um, but is it the only possible reality in second language development? So this is the question here. Um, so the answer would be no. And we have a growing number of studies uh, revealing that both native first language and second language interact in many different aspects, uh, regardless of bilingual proficiency. Um, so summing up, cross-linguistic interaction is bidirectional, and the L2 also influences the L1, as in this second image. We have the L1 arrows towards the L2, but also L2 content knowledge towards um, the L1. Um, and we know that, for example, um, first language and second language lexical items are always activated at some levels. We also know that first language and second language cell systems cohabit the same phonetic phonological space in the brain. We know that bilinguals present intermediate syntactic processing between L1 and L2, and the list just goes on, right? Um, but we also know that if a second language becomes more uh, prevalent, more frequent, more dominant for a bilingual, the transference, uh, the influence might take a different direction. And that's why sometimes immigrants don't sound like their monolingual compatriots, for example. Um, so to Barbara Koch, a great name on language attrition, she says that with an L2, with a second language, an individual's first language will at some point be irrevocably changed. Um, and the changes in the first language that are triggered by second language development is what we currently call first language attrition. So of course the realm of first language attrition, sorry, the realm of language attrition goes beyond first language attrition including, for example, second language attrition, foreign language attrition for those who separate second and foreign languages. But in this presentation, um, attrition refers to first language alteration to first language attrition. At this point, I think it's valid to point out as well that some authors, and Giovanni, use the name drift for this phenomenon. And for this presentation, let's say they are the same thing. So the term attrition might sound weird, um, unusual, and new to some of you, but actually it has, it has almost 80 years, and it was coined by Einar Haugen in 1938, um, when he found out that Norwegian immigrants uh, would produce their first language in many ways that were different from Norwegian um, monolinguals, um, compatriots. Right? Um, it's important to, to point out that first language attrition was described at all linguistic levels, so from phonetics to pragmatics. Um, some studies even talk about conversational attrition, for example, um, reduced or increased levels of politeness in speech production, levels of politeness in communication. Right? Um, regarding phonetics and phonology, um, first language attrition was uh, also described in speech production and perception and it was verified in uh, different levels. So we have a trited L1 vowel sounds, a trited consonants, a trited L1 syllables, and of course, a trited L1 supersegmental aspects. Um, and however, it's a pity studies on syllables and prosodic uh, features are rare. And, and this is why I'm very happy to learn that Anderson Silva, supervised by Ronaldo, 
is working on nutrition syllables and in the Christianity Conceição Silva from which he is currently working with attrition and prosody in Brazil. Um, those are two areas that are drastically under research in the domain of attrition. Um, but the question, but this question remains, so is language or is first language attrition a rare phenomenon? Um, well, back in the day, it was considered a very rare and unusual phenomenon. Uh, language attrition was seen as a product of long periods of immigration to a new country and to a consistent or shortage of contact with the old one. Um, however, we know things have changed. Uh, now we know that first language attrition is, of course, yes, more intense in L2 contexts, but we also have learned that bilinguals might present a trited L1 data in their home, uh, home country. Uh, for instance, uh, Cheng uh, demonstrates first language attrition after a few days in L2 dominant settings. Uh, Alvis Lukini Shereshevsky revealed first language attrition by Argentinian advanced users of English in Argentina. Shereshevsky Alvis Kupski show first language attrition by intermediate and advanced users of English in the L1 context. Kupski forthcoming um, shows the impact of one single session of L2 explicit pronunciation instruction on uh, Brazilian Portuguese speech production by Brazilian intermediate users of English. And we have Dimitrieva, Jongman, and Sirino, and Osborne and Simone uh, revealing first language attrition by emerging bilinguals, that is, L2 classroom learners in L1 context. Uh, so, um, this body of research uh, clearly tells us, at least in my opinion, uh, that attrition also takes place very rapidly, just after a few weeks, um, and also in first language uh, contexts, and of course, across different proficiency levels and across different uh, learning scenarios as well. Um, so this is the take home message number two. Um, I think it's more than clear now that bilingualism affects both the second language and the first language, even when a language is learned from childhood. So once again, Barbara Cook says, with the development of a second language, the first language of an individual at some point and in some level will be altered. So here, sorry, there's a meme. So everyone, do you ever uh, mix up languages? Me and uh, they pretty much stay in their own lanes and those are the lanes. Uh, and it's usually, of course, to, to, to perceive accent in other speakers than in ourselves. So we usually don't realize we are a trident, for example. So to finish this part also with the meme. Um, so being bilingual means slowly forgetting our first language and still mispronouncing everything of the second one. Of course, it's an over, over the top meme, uh, but I think we can get the gist, right? So when we learn a second language, we'll have some consequences to the other. Um, and well, a merchandise moment, sorry, but um, as far as I'm concerned, this is the first book with an easy introduction to language attrition in Brazilian Portuguese, and it was released last week. Um, by the way, everyone in this round table has at least one chapter in this book. So uh, if you're interested in downloading this free book, uh, just use the QR code. I'm going to give you um, some seconds. Okay. Um, so um, part two, don't worry, part one was the longest, so finally part two. Um, well, um, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, guys, um, who are new to language acquisition, but to study language development, and I, I mean broadly speaking, including first and second language development, is very, very difficult, um, mainly because we investigate changes over time. Well, at least we should be investigating that. Um, and time is a is the lady of variables, and it's a very demanding lady because time demands a specific ways to collect and to gather uh, data, a specific ways to organize and to describe data. Uh, it demands more sophisticated inferential statistic, statistics, and the list goes on. And to investigate second language development and first language acquisition, I'm sorry, guys, it's even harder. Uh, basically because we must consider the constant interplay between the first language and the second language. And now we know that cross-linguistic influences is bidirectional and the first languages are also adaptive. And 
um, individual differences in other non-linguistic variables um, seem to have a stronger effect in second language development and in attrition than they have in first language acquisition. And of course, on top of that, um, the outcomes of second language development and first language attrition vary a lot from one individual to another. And that's actually um, the consequence of this more intense effect of individual differences in all linguistic variables. Um, so the point here is that first language attrition ends up imposing some challenges to second language acquisition. Um, for example, first language, first language attrition is seen currently as a natural part of bilingualism, as we have just seen, right? And that reveals some issues to the area, to the area of second language speech development. Um, the studies on bilingual development, for example, that consider only what happens to the second language or only uh, the influence of the first language might be in a way neglecting a reasonable part of the whole process. And actually some authors, I don't agree with that, but they would say we would be neglecting at least, at, at least no, but 50% of the process. Um, so another methodological limitation um, is connected to the recruitment of participants to our experiments. Uh, as we have seen so far, it's clear that bilingualism um, and mainly immigration changes the album production and perception. So, Immigrants just don't produce, um, they don't perceive their first languages as do monolingual compatriots, for example. Um, and this to Monica Schmidt um, is an obvious problem to areas that or try to investigate, sorry, or try to identify people or try to verify speakers. For example, um, this is particularly true for forensic phonetics. Uh, when, when you confront recorded speech data prior and after immigration from the same participant, for instance, you may, un, you may end up with a false result. So you might say, no, this is not the same person when it is uh, the same person, for example. And of course, I'm talking about an extreme case of language attrition. Um, and, and we know that in Brazil, it's not easy to do science. Uh, we don't have funding, and mainly, specifically, in humanities. Just check the new um, CNPq uh, announcements, you're going to see that. Um, and sometimes we need natives uh, of a given language to our experiments. And some of us are based far from international borders, and those who are actually close to the borders have basically only Spanish, right? So um, we usually stick to the natives we have just around the corner to our experiments. Um, but uh, these questions remain. So could we use second language stimuli from second language immigrants who live in Brazil? Or could we use them to judge or to validate second language data or tasks? Could we use first language stimuli from Brazilian bilinguals? Um, well, based on what we have seen, not ideally, right? Because they just don't represent monolinguals. And it is not rare that an immigrant is judged to be a non-native speaker of his or her very young first language. Um, so basically, we need to do two things that are um, not easy. Um, first, we should not divide this multifactorial system that also includes L1 and L1 attrition adaptability into smaller components. And secondly, we must remember when planning our study that first languages are open systems and they change over time. That's what they do, right? So control experimental groups uh, have to be well planned, well, well tailored. And that has to be crystal clear for the study replication, uh, for instance. Um, so, um, finally, um, the final part of this presentation. So, challenges in investigating first language attrition. So, uh, this is the Oxford uh, Handbook of Language Attrition, um, definitely the most expensive, but the most complete book on attrition. Um, well, it costs uh, more than a thousand uh, AIs, and remember that my birthday is coming in October, and I don't have this book. Um, so attrition has been well described, just check this book and you'll see it, but we still need to investigate the nature um, and the linguistic 
cognitive and social principles that govern first language depression. So first language and second language contact or first language and second language frequency um, of use are just some of the variables we must consider in our studies. Um, we know um, that contact uh, and first language and second language frequency are very important variables, but there are different other variables. And some scholars claim that non linguistic variables are the most important ones. Important ones. Um, for example, attitudes, uh, motivation, and emotions have robust roles in first language attrition, as they have in second language development. And according to Ben Raphael and Schmidt, even the reasons that underline um, the immigration have an impact in first language uh, attrition or retention. Am I migrating because I need a better job, or am I migrating because I'm a refugee and I'm fighting against that kind of you know, oppression, for example? Um, for example, it's clear currently that the social semiotic context of immigration plays a more important role in attrition than length of immersion or length of residence in the new country. And we usually think that length of residence is the most important variable, right? So, um, but we know that integrated immigrants have bigger social networks with the host country and are more willing to use the host language there. So, um, and this immersion into the second language soci uh, soci uh, social landscapes and this willingness to communicate leads to the convergence of patterns of the L2 and therefore to the adjustment and to the attrition of the first language. Um, so um, it's crystal clear, um, at, least, at least for me, of course, that first language attrition is a highly dynamic phenomenon. Um, so it demands, it requires equally dynamic research techniques. Um, and in addition, we must examine uh, characteristics of the participants um, and get a very detailed profile of their background. So it is important because many aspects of language history and present patterns of language used will affect attrition. But what makes things incredibly difficult um, is the fact that factors such as attitudes, motivation, and emotions, they're also dynamic systems. And they change over time. Um, for example, um, I have better feelings about Brazil before our past elections. Um, so uh, we must continuously update participants' profile as well, at least uh, related to those uh, variables that also may change across and through time. So a consequence of all this um, and a challenge is that we need more sophisticated statistical treatment. Um, so we need more elaborate models because we need to combine uh, the influence of different variables, right? And we rely a lot on basic correlations, t-tests, ANOVAs, because we usually compare groups in first language attrition and we say, yes, they are attracted or no, they are not attracted. And this is not enough. Not anymore. So we need to learn how to use, for example, regression models or Bayesian statistics and modeling, for example. Um, and we need to broaden the range of the quantitative tools we use to study language as a dynamic system and therefore first language attrition. And at this point, for example, Oshereshevsky and Professor Rubirita Kikovo Alves, um, they have been working with very nice and linear models to, to be used in longitudinal studies. And then, guys, if you have questions about you know, sophisticated models, uh, send me an email, and I'll kindly forward your message to Professor Ronaldo Lima Jr., the one next in line, to talk to answer your question. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm joking, but I think it's important to let the new generation hear that we also struggle with statistics, right? And this is mainly true for those who work in humanities. Um, when you learn a test, boom, there's a better model or there's a better language. Uh, but guys, remember, in our case, the statistics serves linguistics, not the other way around. So another challenge is that studies on first language attrition usually focus on the group level. Um, and large groups of participants are interesting um, for describing, of course, central tendencies, uh, but they mask idiosyncrasies and individual variations. So, um, only with group work, only general, um, sometimes limited, persistent pattern is revealed. 
Um, so proposals that focus on the individual are essential to capture modularity and dynamics of first language attrition. Um, so the most adequate way to, to investigate first language attrition would be through a careful implementation of a longitudinal experiment. Um, for example, testing participants before and after immigration and then at different points in time. So this should be, or actually this is essential for understanding the influence of the second language on the first language. Um, and we still have the, and still have very few studies. And again, Shereshevsky and Nubita Takikov Alves have very interesting, have very interesting studies in this fashion. However, we know <laughs> this type of research is not always doable and it is time consuming, there is regular commitment from participants, and of course it, it's more expensive. Um, so um, just a reminder here, um, qualitative research designs do not by themselves guarantee a more dynamic perspective for research, particularly if the research design the sign is not inherently connected to or informed by a dynamic conceptual framework. Um, so I think one of the main challenges in the, in the area of first language attrition is actually accepting that languages are dynamic and that first languages are not rigid and may alter over time. So instead of only thinking about new methodologies, we should um, spare some time to revisit the nature of grammar and grammar stability as well. I think this is key for us to fully comprehend first language attrition. Um, so final remarks and final take home messages. So first language attrition has to be viewed as part of the lingualism, bilingualism and cross-linguistic influences by directional as suggested by Colin colleagues, for example, and that impacts the way we investigate second language speech development. And finally, uh, first language attrition affects all the many subsystems involved in language, both in production and comprehension. However, the nature of the specific causes of first language attrition remain unclear, and investigating these causes is the current main challenge. Um, so some of my references. Um, thank you very much. And here you have the QR code again to uh, download this presentation. So thank you. So thank you, Felipe, for your presentation. Um, there are lots of things for us to discuss later, right? When we finish with the three presentations. But now I would like to invite our third guest, Professor Ronaldo Lima Jr., to talk about L2 speech corpus creation. Okay, hello everyone, good afternoon. Uh, I, I must begin saying it's a pleasure to share this uh, round table with my dear uh, friends and colleagues, Hannah, Felipe, and Rosani. Uh, I'm thank thankful for Rosani for inviting me to be a part of this. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, talking about this topic, especially uh, uh, data sharing and data management, uh, which has become a dear uh, topic to me. Okay, so in my talk to today, the title I had is Second Language Speech Data, which is the title of the round table, and specifically challenges in creating a corpus of English L2 speech for open access. Okay, so uh, I'll briefly talk about impor the importance of uh, data sharing, and then I'll talk specifically about our project. Okay, so um sharing data and when i say data here it's not only uh speech data as hannah was saying but uh uh in in our case it could be form and frequency values duration values so the values you work with and even uh scripts and files you use for your data analysis okay so when i say sharing data all this uh, is, is included, okay? So the, the most, uh, the, the, the greatest importance for sharing data nowadays is due to several replication crises that we have uh, uh, witnessed in the past few years. I think in, in psychology, the crisis in psychology was the most recent, a replica, replication crisis. 
people, um, researchers um, got those some classical or famous studies, tried to replicate them and couldn't get the same results. And little by little, these different crises that happened in different fields showed that uh, the way that information was published and shared uh, was not enough for people to really know how each study was conducted, uh, how each analysis was conducted. And uh, by sharing data and sharing the details of analysis and so on, other researchers can come and replicate the study. And this is beneficial for any scientific field because then it leads to critique of one's study and then hopefully improvement of uh, uh, that type of study, which will lead to more reproducibility, right? Uh, there was there is a, 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 a paper called The Pervasive Power of P-Values, uh, in which the author says that with great results come great responsibility, right? Make reference to uh, uh, comic books. But anyway, saying that... Uh, um, every now and then, there might be a paper in a field with some great results, some uh, results that change everything or they promise to change everything. And uh, just publishing a paper with great results is not enough. If you have some great results that have never been published before or that are contrary to what had been pu published before, uh, much more... Uh, robustness of your analysis needs to be in there, right? And sharing the data so that other researchers can uh, hop in and uh, uh, replicate, look at the, the analysis, try with different participants, critique and so on is necessary to really see if those great results uh, are, are real or if uh, with better analysis and uh, a better design, uh, results would be different, okay? I have two examples uh, to tell you. The first one is from uh, a book on Bayesian statistics by Richard McCarrick, and uh, he gives this example in the book. He mentions that in, in 2015, there was this paper published in a high-impact journal. Uh, the study was conducted with 1,170 children, so a lot of participants, a very high uh, uh, sample size, and it showed a negative association between religiosity and generosity, which was something contradictory to, to all the previous studies, right? Because all previous studies in this particular field showed that the more that re religiosity and generosity, they had a positive uh, association, a positive correlation. And then when and, and this called a stir in the field, right? Because people say, "Oh, how how come, right?" Uh, and, and and it looked like a robust study. But when people looked at the data, and thankfully the data was shared, they saw that there was this this mistake in the analysis. That when researchers entered the countries, they were uh, coded by numbers, and when they entered the countries in their uh, statistical software. Those numbers they were entered as, uh, continu as as a continuous variable and not as a categorical variable as they should have. So this this means that uh, uh, the model interpreted Canada, for instance, which was labeled country number two, as being twice as much country as the U.S. that was coded uh, country number one. So th this was. A, a simple mistake, right, which happens. And uh, in this case, there was a happy ending because the paper was retracted and uh, uh, the, the mistake was uh, uh, known. And, uh, well, this 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 had a happy ending because data was shared and other people could take a look at it, okay? Another example, this one I also got from Richard McCarrick, but it's from a video that he did uh, uh, last year, which is on YouTube. And he also mentions this, second example here in in 2010 there was this uh paper on economics called growth in a time of debt published by two uh harvard professors reinhardt and rogoff and this paper was very influential if you remember in 2008 there was a, a big economic crisis in the world which began in the united states and this particular paper uh showed that there was this relation between uh, government uh, spending on uh, uh, 
on, on the social and economic recovery of the country and how uh, the economic growth of the country diminished the more countries invested, right? So it, it was a paper that defended austerity, okay? And this paper was influential in the United States in, in policy making. It was literally waved on the floor of the Congress House. And uh, as a consequence, it was influential in Europe as well for, for decisions concerning uh, how the government should invest or not invest money in the recovery of the country. And then in, in 2013, uh, this guy whose photo is there, Thomas Her Herndon, he was a graduate student uh, in economics, now he's a professor, uh, he tried to replicate the data. The data hadn't been shared by uh, the original uh, authors of the, the 2010 paper, but the data uh, that they used, uh, government investment and uh, GDP, this is, this is uh, uh, it's, it's easy to find online. So he found the data and he could not get the same results. So he contacted the authors a few times and eventually the authors were kind enough to share the data and uh, uh, the, the procedures that they used to make the analysis. And he discovered that there was this little problem in their Excel spreadsheet. This is the, the actual spreadsheet. In the formula that they used, not all cells were selected in a certain column. And this led to the results that they had. And then when reevaluating the data, but using all the data, because they ended up not using all the data, when using all the data, the results were uh, the opposite, right? They were against austerity. So again, another happy ending because the authors were transparent enough and kind enough, and this is uh, great. Uh, and they shared the data and the mistake was found. But what if the data hadn't been shared in those two cases? And what about the, the several studies that are out there uh, whose data will never be shared, right? Uh, so here is our, our, our two examples of this, right? Uh, in this video by Richard McCarrath, where I got the second example, he says that uh, many times uh, from, from a survey, says that many times when researchers are, are contacted to share data, some of them even feel offended, right, by uh, someone asking them to share data and, and it could be data sets or scripts, procedures and so on. Some of them don't reply. And uh, something that is often uh, is that uh, people sometimes they don't have the data anymore, don't have the files or they don't have the details. They don't know which version was actually used, right? So when uh, preparing the data and running statistics, uh, different files are created for, and, uh, and they are named in chaotic ways. So uh, researchers sometimes don't even know which version of the files that they have on, the, on their computer uh, was the one used to publish the paper. And then uh, this, this is just then to emphasize that the default behavior uh, of researchers should be, first of all, keep files organized, right? Uh, there are systems for uh, creating folders and subfolders on your computer. There are systems for naming files and all these to ensure something called version control, which is necessary, right? So if your folders and files on your computer is chaotic and sometimes you want to find something and you have no idea in which folder it is, or oh, I thought it was there, but it's not. And when you look at the files, there are so many versions of the same file, you don't know which one is which. If you need to send a file to somebody and the name of the file is not informative or it has special characters and spaces and so on, uh, take a look at, at, at naming files and creating uh, folders. Uh, it, it, it might be uh, a little more systematic than we intuitively believe, right? So this is one first step, keep keeping things organized on our computers. But then the second step would be keeping them online and online for backup to yourself and also to make them public, easily shareable, and so that people can come and replicate and look and adapt and give you feedback and help you improve and so on, okay? If you recognize the two icons that are there, you're one step ahead, right? Because these are two of the uh, most popular websites, I would say, to do this for keeping uh, uh, files online for version control, so once you add files or change them, uh, the websites will keep track of these changes, okay? And it's easy to share. The first one is GitHub, and the second one is OSF, Open Science Framework, okay? Now, 
something really important in orange, which I added to my slides while I was watching Hannah's talk, is to remember then to include uh, 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 the possibility of sharing your data online in your research projects before you submit, it, submit your project to ethics committees, right? Okay, so this was uh, a, a, uh, an opening just to highlight the importance of sharing data, okay? Now, what is the project then that I want to talk about? Well, it's, it's a project that uh, was planned and is being conducted at the moment by Rosane Silveira, who is moderating this roundtable, by myself, by Ubiratã Alves from uh, uh, Federal do Rio Grande do Sul, and Clerton Barbosa from uh, Universidade Estadual do Rio Grande do Norte. And together, we had this idea of uh, creating a corpus of uh, uh, speech data of English spoken by Brazilians. And we had the idea of having a longitudinal corpus, okay? And uh, what we're doing now here at Interab 12 uh, is we're trying to do what we preach. So what I just said, said about the importance of sharing data, we're trying to make our project public so that we can get feedback and let people know uh, uh, the whereabouts of the project. And we're doing this here right now in this round table. And we also published a paper last year uh, in Revista Culinearis, where we talk about the project. The things that I'm going to talk about here, they are more detailed in the paper, okay? And uh, anyway, what the project here is to create a corpus that is going to be available for researchers to use, but then it's still needed, we still need that researchers that actually use uh, our corpus then share uh, their, their files, their analysis procedures and so on, okay? So the goal of this project is to collect longitudinal speech data, right? So as Felipe was saying just right before me, if, if, if you want to really have a, a view of the, the trajectories of uh, language development, longitudinal data is what you need to look at, right? So, and collecting longitudinal data is very challenging. So we thought of... Um, uh, putting the energy into creating this corpus so that it can be used for years and years by many researchers, okay? And uh, we have already started collecting some of the data, and I'm going to, to tell you in a minute uh, how much of the data we have already collected, but the idea is to collect uh, data from speakers of four different states in Brazil. So speakers in Rio Grande do Sul, uh, Bira is, o Biratã Alves is going to collect uh, the data there, from Santa Catarina, which Rosane has been collecting, from Rio Grande do Norte, which Clerton is already collecting, and from Ceará, which I'm going to begin collecting very soon, okay? So we know Brazil has this variety of dialects, and we tried to have uh, speakers from different regions, but also using uh, 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 the, the power that, that we have by having uh, us in different institutions, right? Uh, and we're collecting or are going to collect data from undergraduate students of English language teaching, so from Letras Inglês, undergraduate students of Executive Secretariat, and learners taking regular English courses uh, offered by uh, some of the universities. And we're also collecting uh, Portuguese data from uh, um, those learners, okay? Uh, now, what are the, the, the challenges, challenges and slash possibilities in doing this? First, we wanted to create an instrument that we could collect uh, as much data for as many different types of studies as possible, but in a feasible manner, right? So that uh, the, the data collection is not too long, so that uh, speakers uh, feel motivated to participate. We we, it wouldn't be feasible, for instance, to have data collection lasting for three hours, right? Having students perform all types of tasks. So we had to do this uh, puzzle of uh, including as much as we thought would be uh, interesting to, to look into, but also in a feasible uh, manner, right? So what did we decide to do? We decided to collect uh, a, a, a sample of a uh, speaker's proficiency in English, so speakers, they do a, a image description task. And the idea is to get 30 seconds of that uh, description and assign it to four different judges for them to judge the proficiency based 
on common European framework of reference. We also have two tests of uh, production in Portuguese, one to collect vowels, another one to collect consonants, and we're using these uh, uh, two carrier sentences, right? The first, in the first carrier sentence, we can use three of the words uh, we came up with, right? In, in X e Y temos Z, for instance. And in the second one, we can use two words. And then we have three tests of production in English, right? To collect uh, vowels, collect consonants, and uh, syllable patterns. All these thinking about the Brazilian learner and uh, the vowels, consonants, and syllable structures that are particularly challenging for the Brazilian learner. And we also have uh, these two carrier senses that allow, allow us to uh, insert three words, three target words in each carrier sentence, okay? So this is a summary of uh, what we're collecting, but with uh, a few more details, okay? So in, in the proficiency, uh, they do an image description. And, uh, well, I already said this, 30 seconds, a panel of judges, they judge students in a Likert scale using the Common European Framework of Reference. For the production tests in Portuguese, the first test is meant to collect uh, data on uh, oral stressed vowels in Portuguese. And we are using, uh, uh, 10 different words uh, uh, per vowel, so a total of 70 words uh, are collected in, it, in this test one. And for test two, we're collecting uh, the, 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 the rationale behind it is to collect their production of plosives and rhotics in onsets, rhotics, laterals, and nasals in coda, and heterosyllabic consonant clusters. So thinking about the comparisons we want to make, right? Thinking about what we're, we're going to collect in English and how those could be compared to, to their production in Portuguese. And for the production in English, the first test is meant to collect uh, vowels, English vowels and plosives. And we're using 38 words for this. Test two is meant to collect total syllabic consonant clusters, rhotics, laterals, and nasals. And we're using 39 words for this. And for test three, complex codas, dental fricatives, and finally DNS, 109 words for this. If you look at the paper, we have tables listing all the words because this is a real challenge. We had many meetings so that we could think of the words, think of the context, phonological context, presenting uh, the same target sound surrounded by different uh, sounds so that we could also account for variability and so on. Okay. Uh, at the moment, we have some data from Santa Catarina. So Rosani has already started collecting data there. And we also have data from Rio Grande do Norte, which Clayton has already collected. Uh, here in Ceará and in Rio Grande do Sul, Biratã and myself, we were, we were waiting uh, to buy uh, soundproof booths to which we already had. Uh, actually, I think Biratã already had uh, uh, a grant for this, and I was applying for one that I eventually got. So we were waiting to actually install our soundproof booths to conduct the collection. That's why uh, we started at, at different moments, okay? Uh, a great challenge in collecting longitudinal data is keeping participants coming, right? Our idea is to collect data once a semester. And uh, if you have already collected longitudinal data, you know how challenging this is, keeping participants. In 2017, I started a project here to collect data. My idea was to collect data for nine semesters of students taking Letras Inglês. In the first semester, I got all 50 to consent and participate in, 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 in the data collection, but 40-something actually came. In the second semester, I had 20-something. In the third, 11 or 12. And in the fourth semester, I had only five participants coming, and then I gave up on the rest of the collection. This is a real challenge, right? So any, any suggestions are really appreciated, okay? Other challenges we had, I already mentioned this, is the infrastructure. So in Santa Catarina, Rosani already had a, sound, a soundproof booth in her lab. Uh, Ubiratan got one, and I got one as well. And uh, in Rio Grande do Norte, uh, Clayton doesn't have a, a soundproof booth, but has high quality recorders and he's using silent rooms and so on okay now, one of the greatest challenges uh, especially for the data collection that already started was the pandemic right because then uh how to keep collecting data right 
So in Santa Catarina, that Rosani was collecting data in the soundproof booth, she had to pause data collection. And uh, Clayton uh, managed to continue collecting data, but in a remote online manner, okay? And here in Ceará and in Rio Grande do Sul, we're waiting for uh, uh, activities to come back to normal face-to-face -face so we can uh, actually begin our data collection. So the pandemic was <laughs> a real challenge. In my case, I remember that uh, uh, one day before Fortaleza was closed, uh, for the first time in 2020, one day before was the day that I finished installing our sound, uh, our, our soundproof booth. The booth was already there. Uh, oh, oh, during the weekend, I bought some cables and some other details. On Monday, I installed everything, tested the booth, and on Tuesday, the city was completely closed, and we never came back to full face-to-face -face activities at university, so we're waiting for this. Uh, now, another challenge then is sharing the data, right? Sharing the data and in a user-friendly interface. Our idea is that researchers that want to use our corpus can uh, filter for different uh, aspects of the data, right? So filtering according to uh, proficiency level of participants, if they're literacy students, if they are executive secretariat uh, undergraduates, if they are regular language students, uh, the semester they're in, uh, the state, where they come from, and so on, okay? And uh, this year, a few months ago, actually, one of the librarians here at Federal University of Ceará, Juliana Soares Lima, sent a proposal uh, to a grant by uh, Rede Nacional de Ensino e Pesquisa, Instituto Brasileiro de Informação em Ciência e Tecnologia, and CNPq, it's, it's a joint grant, uh, and it was a grant specifically for data repositories to be shared uh, for as, as an open science action. And uh, we actually, uh, our project was uh, uh, approved. So uh, we're at the moment uh, uh, writing a document called Data Management Plan. And hopefully very soon, we're going to have the first data we already collected from Santa Catarina and Rio Grande do Norte available in the Dataverse uh, software. So uh, some news to come soon, we hope, okay? Uh, okay, and, and the data, as I said, the data collection in Ceará and in Rio Grande do Sul will still begin. So we could use feedback and suggestions and recommendations from people. And uh, we're already using some from uh, Rosani and, and Clayton, who already started collecting data on things that we, we might improve in, in, in these two data collections that will still begin, right? So uh, a possibility maybe is, I don't, I don't know, should we collect data of students reading a text as well? Speaking freely, they are, we already have data of them speaking freely in the proficiency uh, part that they take, but I don't know, maybe some, some other type of speech. Uh, something that I started talking to Felipe uh, last month and in his talk just before mine, uh, uh, this, this keeps ringing in my mind is that Initially, we, we thought of collecting the production data of Portuguese only in the first semester. But now I'm, I'm thinking, uh, uh, I, I believe that we should collect the Portuguese data every semester as well, along with the, the English data because of language, language attrition, right? If we want to compare a uh, student's production of English in the sixth semester, for instance, then we should compare that with their Portuguese production in the sixth semester as well, right? And uh, uh, this would give an even more data for other researchers, okay? And other suggestions and recommendations uh, are welcome, okay? So it's it's basically this. And uh, the idea of this corpus is, is for, for us four that are conducting uh, the project to use this data for many years in our own, own uh, research agendas, but of course, make it available for all researchers interested in second language speech and that uh, would be willing to use English L2 spoken by Brazilians as their corpus to use the corpus and, and share their results and share uh, uh, their research, okay? So I'll be glad to take uh, any questions and uh, especially suggestions, okay? So thank you very much. Thank you, Ronaldo. And now um, we have a few questions from the audience. They haven't posted many questions yet, but you still have time. 
Uh, I will start with questions from the audience and then I myself have many questions. I hope I don't, I don't think we have time for all of them, but I'll, I'll try to ask some of them, okay? Uh, I'll begin with questions from uh, Ubiratan Alves. He asked um, two questions. He asked one question to Hannah and one to Ronaldo. So his question to Hannah is, according to CONEP Brazil, the research design is also an ethical issue since there is no point in recruiting participants to take part in a study that will not yield valid results. As far as I could see from your presentation, this is also the case in the European Union. Is that right? As a researcher, would you agree with this assumption? Yeah, um, I definitely agree with that. And I think this is one of the characteristics that we could see that is universal. So something that we would follow in Brazil and in Finland. And I think that independently of whether we actually have to file for an ethical review from an ethics committee or whether the researcher is expected to kind of follow the guidelines and create an ethical design for the data. I think independently of that, it definitely is an ethical choice of thinking how you will treat your participants, how you will deal with your data um, and kind of find the balance between conducting research and, and obtaining, um, protecting your participants' privacy and sensitivity, right? Okay. Um, I have a question for you. I have many questions, Han. I'm going to ask two, and then if we have more time, I'll ask again. Okay. Okay. Um, you explained in your presentation that the institutions guarantee that all researchers uh, in Europe would get training in research design, methodology, and analysis. How right. could this be done in Brazilian institutions since we don't really have this as compulsory, right? Right. Um, that is a very difficult question. Um, I think this is a question of priorities and what we consider important. So I think that theoretically in Brazil, there is a way of doing this. The universities do have um, their ProFor Formação Continuada systems and programs. So the system is there, but we would need more funding and we would really have to give more priority to this so that it would become, I don't know if compulsory or obligatory, making it obligatory is necessary, but at least making it available. If that's not enough, then maybe making it obligatory because I think that it is definitely something that we should learn as researchers to deal with. It, it cannot be assumed that we will just find things on our own, right? Okay, I'll ask a last question for you and then I have some questions for the other guests. Um, the other question is, um, do you, uh, you explain that um, if you are conducting your research in Europe, you have to store the consent forms online, if I got it right. Mm -hmm. um, so I've always wondered here in Brazil, we collect the consent forms, right? The signatures for the con consent forms, but we keep the, these forms, right? We don't really show them to anybody. At least I have never been asked to show them. So I've always wondered about this. In, um, in Brazil, we could collect the consent form. So we store it, but do you think all this regulation is necessary? Should we be um um filing these um consent forms somewhere where somebody could inspect them right um i think there are many things that we do just in case in case someone asks us for something um and i think that the same thing applies here so here from what i understand you can either have the physical form or you can have it in a digital form but in case someone would ask it which also i have never heard why would um why would anyone want to do that uh in case someone would ask it you would have to have that available if someone would question so i think that has to do with kind of the open science open science issue of being transparent in the data collection and whether that is necessary or not um Personally, maybe I don't consider it necessary, but I think it's part of um, 
part of how research is conducted and part of those those rules that we have to obey and follow. It's just this question is quite funny in a, on a day like this, <laughs> when in Brazil we know that we we as alto speech researchers have, sometimes have to respond to set like three four times explaining how we are going to deal with the data that we get, and we are trying to make no harm <laughs> to our participants, mm -hmm. right? But then we have um, a health company doing what they have done. So it's a kind of question that really, <laughs> yeah. It, it also shows some of our, um, let's say, our um, let's uh, indignation to the way that we, uh, we are treated sometimes. And then some other people can have it in an easy way. So maybe if right. we had more restrictions, maybe things like that wouldn't happen, right? Yeah, definitely. Especially I mean, the, ru the rules have to apply for everyone, yeah. all instances, private and public, in the same way. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So thank you, Hannah. I'll switch to the other guests. And if I, we have you. more time, I'll ask you questions. OK, thank you. Um, I think Felipe is next, right, Felipe? There is a question from Anderson Almeida da Silva. And he asked, should we expect the same atricity consequences for speakers of different modalities? For example, Portuguese and Libras users. Uh, well, it's a very great question, um, and I think it, it is it is basically under research. I, I can you hear me, guys? There's there's an issue. Okay, um, I think there's just one study on remodel attrition. Um, so I really don't know. It's a good question, but we've been investigating, for example, interpreting. Um, and they usually write or speak in Portuguese as they um, use Libra syntax. Probably that, that's an index of uh, bimodal attrition. That is, they use Libras a lot uh, every day, basically. So while they are writing, they are using uh, the Libras grammar syntactic structures. But I think it's a, it's a great question. I think uh, we should invest time on this kind of study. Uh, but I really don't know what to expect from this kind of interaction of different modalities. I'm sorry. Um, another question here is from me then. Uh, let me choose. Um, okay. It seems that initially um, attrition, right, was treated, a first language attrition was treated as a rare phenomenon, like you explained, right? But now research has been showing that it is actually part of the process of learning another language. Would you say that this understanding will have an impact on the way research with bilinguals or language learners is conducted? Um, well, great question, thank you. Um, First language attrition definitely has an impact on the way we should be studying uh, bilinguals and language learners indeed. Uh, because we usually have this idea that the second language is liquid, variable, and that it develops on um, a very solid structure, perpetuous first language. But now we know the first languages are liquid and variable as well. So we must take that into consideration when playing our studies and ideally to include both first language and second language data, for example. Uh, Ronaldo was um, talking about this, right? So, um, and you have to be uh, very aware and rigorous in recruiting participants, uh, control groups and judges, for example. The point is um, ignorance is bliss in research, right? So if we haven't heard of a phenomenon, how can we consider this phenomenon in our studies? But now attrition is out there and it has at least to be considered in when we plan our future studies. Thank you, Felipe. One last question from me. Um, you posed uh, many questions um, about the nature of the speaker who contributes with data for uh, task judgment or um, uh, baseline data, for example, right? This, these speakers that we record to use in our, uh, as part of our stimuli. Um, and yeah, the considerations are, in the end, is, is there any ideal um, speaker for all this that we do with L2 speech research? 
if attrition is everywhere in first language and in second language, does it make sense to continue to compare bilinguals or language learners' performance based on monolingual on, or native speaker parameters at all? Or is it time for a real change in research methodology? Well, it's a marvelous question. It's a very difficult question, actually. Um, Cook has been saying that, I think uh, Flegg and Bonn has been saying that for a while as well. And Flegg and Bonn had um, make it very explicit in the speech learning model revised, published earlier this year. Um, so the new models are not group models. They are individual differences models. And as I draw from dynamic systems, so I'm very happy with that publication. That's what I believe. So I think we should focus on individual differences and on longitudinal studies. But this kind of research is not easy to do, right? Uh, so, um, however, don't get me wrong, I don't think it's a crime to compare groups. Um, I do that myself. Uh, the problem is not, not a comparison per se, but the idea that it usually underlies comparison is that we are comparing unstable bilinguals to very stable monolinguals or parameters. So I think the creation of groups kills individual variation uh, in the second language, but also in the first language. So I don't think it's only a methodological problem. In my opinion, it's a philosophical problem. So we need to try to understand the comparison and why are we comparing actually our participants. Completely. And for Ronaldo, we have, I think, three questions from the audience. Okay, Ronaldo. So I'll start with those and see how our time goes. Um, the first one is from Bira. It's a long question, so I'll read it. Um, right in the beginning, beginning of your talk, you, you've addressed the importance of replicability in language studies. Nowadays, many new paradigms have argued that the data from a single individual may be the object of developmental analysis. This considered, I would like to hear from you. How replicable are studies based on individual data? And what is the theoretical relevance of replicating individual-based studies? I think it also has to do with the, what Philippe was saying. But... Yes, yes. I had read uh, Bita's question in the chat, and as Philippe was answering, I thought it was a great uh, bridge and connection. Uh, it's a great question, and uh, I think there are three points that I want to make. Uh, the first one, I think, when sharing the data online, you allow for other researchers to first replicate that exact study, replicate in the, in the methodological aspect or the statistical aspect, right? Uh, taking the two examples that I showed before, that uh, two papers give me some uh, tremendous tremendous results, but there were there were some uh, mistakes in the analysis. This could happen to anyone, right? So sharing the analysis of one individual and letting other researchers conduct reconduct analysis of that specific same individual, I think it already has benefits uh, to uh, critique. Uh, uh, suggest, recommend uh, uh, actions uh, in, in the statistical models or in, in the analysis aspect uh, of the study. So, so this is the first point, allowing for people to play with the exact data set uh, you worked with, okay? To see if there are improvements or mistakes or things that could, could have been done differently, okay? Uh, now, the second point is that... Uh, when looking at individual data and replicating studies, uh, the difference is in interpreting the results, right? Uh, I believe we don't expect in the replication to find similar, exact, or even similar results, right? Because they're individual and there is individual variation. It's different from the psychology uh, uh, replication crisis that people expected to find the exact thing because some theory or procedure was based on a classical study. But when looking at individuals uh, in, in second language speech and replicating somebody's study, uh, we don't necessarily expect to find the same results, right? But we expect to find the same usefulness 
or meaningfulness of the method we're using, right? So, for example, uh, the researchers from the University of Groningen, they have those uh, suggestions of data analysis for individual speakers. And uh, we're using some of those analyses in Brazil. Uh, so, Ubiratã and uh, 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 his students have used some of these uh, uh, analyses with our students. And then we don't expect to find the exact same results. So the replication is not a, is not focused on the results, but focused on the usefulness and meaningfulness of the technique of the analysis. Okay, so this is the second point. And the last one is that, uh, and this I have been discussing this for a few years with Felipe, Rosani, Ubiratã, Denise Klug, and uh, uh, other colleagues. This this uh, a movement in our field of. Uh, uh, many years ago, looking at individual data, then looking at grouped data as uh, we as a group learned some uh, 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 null hypothesis significance tests. And now we're discussing individual data again. And personally, myself, I believe that uh, the place we should aim at is one in which we use uh, statistical models that take into account both individual data because of variability, but also group data, right? Because we want to account for uh, uh, variability and individual uh, trajectories of development. But in our field, we also need to have some look at broader tendencies, right, of language development for many reasons, to write materials, to uh, conduct workshops, to plan our classes. So I believe models that take both into account and then I believe that hierarchical regression models, especially Bayesian, Bayesian ones, are, are, are great at doing this, is what we should be looking at. And then just making a little commercial, uh, in, in next year, in New Sounds 2022, the symp Symposium of uh, uh, Second Language Speech Acquisition, uh, Van der Lui, myself, and uh, uh, a graduate student from University of Zurich, we're going to have a special session during the New Sounds 2022, and Ubiratan will have a talk in this special session, which is all about the challenges, but also the need to include group and individual data when analyzing second language speech. So it's 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 something uh, uh, it's a topic that uh, I'm I'm really interested in, and I think we're we're gonna have some uh, more uh, uh, papers and events and opportunities to to try to develop our field. Uh, uh, in this aspect. Um, very detailed answer. I think you you managed to answer the question. I'll try to ask a last question uh, from, from um, Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer is concerned with the kind of consent form that has been used with the participants in the longitudinal project considering that these participants will have their data shared, right, or made available online. So her question, if I got it right, is exactly how, what kind of consent form was given to them? Or I guess she wants to know how they gave permission, if they were asked to give permission to have their data made available online. Jennifer, this is a great question. And while Hannah was talking, I got really worried about this. And I was, my God, look at the bureaucracy and so on. How, how did we manage this in our project? And I went back to the files to see uh, what we had. And uh, we had consent forms from uh, our participants, our TCLE, right, that we use in Brazil. And uh, our ethics committee, well, we, we passed the project in our ethics committee. And in the consent form, it is stated that uh, uh, their data uh, will be made available online in, a, in, a, in the form of a repository uh, anonymously, right? That their, their identity will, won't be uh, uh, available. But uh, in, the, in their consent form, they are told that their data is going to be made available in an online repository. And our ethics committee approved this documentation. And uh, participants who, who have already uh, had their data collected uh, consented to have their data collected and shared online in an open repository. Uh, yeah, I would just add to that maybe that uh, maybe here in Brazil it's not as complicated as Hannah has explained 
this permission because I'm sure that if we were doing this in Finland, we would have to ask for, uh, we would have to have the, uh, the second document that she talked about, right? I forgot what it was called now. Uh, privacy statement. Privacy statement. We don't need to do this in Brazil, but once we submit the, the proposal to SEPI, to the, uh, the, to the ethics board, they actually ask you right up front in the form whether the data will be part of a, um, uh, an online corpus or something uh, similar. So we have to uh, say that in the form and we have to include that information in the, the consent form and that has been done. Okay. Um, I think we have time for final remarks from the three guests. I have some more questions, but I won't ask them because it's um, I have another round table in 10 minutes. So uh, if you want to wrap up your with any comments, go ahead. We can start with Hannah, maybe. OK, I think wrapping up, I think that uh, going from the gathering of talking about attrition and longitudinal data collection and this kind of beautiful project of collaboration between researchers from Brazil, I think it kind of sums up the different challenges that we have and how it will definitely be worth it. So even though whether it is in Europe, whether it is within Brazil, um, the challenges, the problems that we have because of the pandemic or because of the ethics committees and so on, different permissions that we need, it all uh, it all uh, will be worth it. And I think that's why why we're doing why we're doing what we're doing, or we are just crazy and do it because of that. But no. Felipe? Um, well, I just want to say um, thank you guys for this round table. It was very interesting. Um, as I was saying, so we faced many challenges in investigating. Felipe, we cannot. I will ask Ronaldo to go first to see if you can solve your sound problem. Uh, well, I just want to say that I'm really glad to see that there are so many researchers uh, uh, in second language speech. Uh, uh, here in the round table and in the chat and engaging in questions and discussions. And I want to say how glad I am to see uh, uh, many researchers uh, interested in uh, data driven uh, research. Right. So uh, it, I, I'm happy to see uh, each time more and more people interested in working with uh, actual data and uh, improving their analysis and uh, having uh, this uh, open science movement. Uh, at the moment is ideal for us to share uh, and uh, uh, work in uh, with collaboration with uh, other colleagues and uh, as a group uh, work to uh, advance uh, our field. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm really glad that we are at this moment. Felipe? Let's try. Is it working now? Okay, I just want to say uh, thank you. I really didn't know what's going on. I'm sorry, guys. So just thank you. Uh, it was a pleasure to be in this round table, right? Um, that's all. I don't know what's happening with my mic. Thank, thank you, guys. Okay, thank you, Felipe. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank. I want to thank the audience for the questions. It was a pleasure to have the three guests. Um, they are people that I always learn from and with, and I hope we can continue that journey, right? Uh, I think I would, I would like to thank Anderson and Uberto for the amazing job. I'm sorry, guys, if we couldn't speak slowly. We have no training <laughs> in speaking slowly, so sorry. And thank you, Sanson, San for all the support. and. Uh, this um, roundtable will be recorded. Please recommend it to people who are interested in open science and l speech research. Thank you, Abralin, for accepting our roundtable proposal. See you around. <laughs>